Good morning. Greetings in the name of the Lord. It's so great to praise the Lord with you guys here on Sundays and during the week and making mighty shouts of praise to Almighty God. It's awesome. We love it. We're making our way through the book of Acts in the New Testament, starting in chapter 4 today. If you need a Bible to follow along, you can raise your hand. We'll bring you one. We're reading out of the New King James Version. should be able to follow that with your Bible. And if you don't have a Bible at home, please take that gift, that Bible, as a gift from the Lord today. As we study the book of Acts, we see a true example of authentic Christianity, a biblical model for the church today, as well as a model for our personal Christian lives. And as we see the church born in Acts chapter 2, and then we watch the church begin to grow in Acts chapter 3, we will now see another normal part of the Christian life in chapter 4, and that's persecution. It's a normal part of the Christian experience, if it's authentic. And it's important to have the right perspective when persecution takes place, and we can, all by looking at the book of Acts, which in a sense gives us this aerial view of the real issues, the true issues, and most importantly, the spiritual issues concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ. Still the same today, yesterday, and forever. We remember in chapter 3, Peter and John had gone up to the Jewish temple to pray at the afternoon prayer time. They didn't see anything wrong with going there to pray for God's people and God's work through the gospel of Jesus. How naive they really were. And as they went, Peter noticed a man that was laid there at this beautiful gate daily because he was born lame from birth and he was laid there day after day. The power of the Holy Spirit came upon Peter and he told the man to look at them. And then he commanded the man to rise and walk in the name of Jesus and lifted the man up when his feet were made whole, and the man began to leap and, and jump and, and rejoice that he was healed. Then the man went into the temple courtyard with Peter and John, and this large area is there called Solomon's Porch. And many of the people that had gone to the temple year after year recognized this man, and he's still doing jumping jacks going, look! God healed me. And everybody gets full of excitement. The word goes out. People begin to stream into this place by the thousands. And that's when Peter saw the opportunity to tell the people it was Jesus that healed this man. Jesus whom you crucified, but God raised from the dead. And that Peter and John were witnesses. And it was faith in the name of Jesus that allowed the lame man to be completely healed, giving Peter this opportunity to tell about Jesus. And as Peter confronted them because they had rejected Jesus as their Messiah just a month and a half before, he also consoled them, assuring them that he knew they had done that in ignorance and that they could repent or change their mind about Jesus. And Peter said their sins would be erased, blotted out, and that they would be refreshed in the presence of the Lord and could be turned from their iniquity or sinful nature back to God. Pretty amazing work of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in this place, as Peter is declaring these things, the Jewish religious authorities there could not help 
But notice, as I said, thousands of people were pouring in to that area of the temple, which we remember was about 36 acres at the time of Christ. And they rushed up with the temple police and everything, put a stop to what was taking place. And that's where we start in verse 1 of chapter 4 today. We are told, now as they spoke, they being Peter and John, as they spoke to the people, <clears throat> the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed. And the number of the men came to be about 5,000. It's interesting to listen to the narrative of this story. It's a historical narrative of the early church recorded by Luke, the New Testament gospel writer. And he tells us that the Holy Spirit of God is moving in the lives of these apostles at the temple and the word is preached, people are saved, and persecution comes in that order. And notice it comes from the established religious group that is supposed to believe in the same God that, that Peter and John believe in, which helps us understand at times even well-meaning people that think they follow God can be a source of tremendous discouragement and even persecution. It's a part of really living for Jesus in this fallen world. And to me, this seems to be the most difficult kind of persecution because these are folks that say they believe in God but are seriously misguided and they are deceived by their own sinful nature and the pressure of this fallen world system and deeply influenced by the devil. How do we know that? The Apostle John, writing in the New Testament, would declare that the real enemies of the people of God are the world. This fallen world we live in and the flesh, our fallen nature and the devil that influences us through those things. And we are susceptible to those same kinds of things. And we must be aware of it. And we can, through the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, God has given us and equipped us for everything we need to live godly lives, powerful lives, in the work of the Spirit and not be controlled by what this world says, but to be led by the Holy Spirit. Jesus even told his followers in the Gospels that if they, speaking of these religious rulers, persecuted Jesus, that they would also persecute his disciples. Jesus said, if they've hated me, they will hate you. For a servant is not greater than his master. And Jesus even went so far as to say, when that happens, when you're persecuted by people for following me, when you're persecuted for my sake, rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who came before you. And as we remember the lives of the Old Testament prophets, the difficult places that God allowed them to endure, we realize that those difficult places validated the truth of their faith before God and man. And we study the prophets now. We look at what God put them through. We understand where they're coming from in this aspect of being persecuted for following Jesus ourselves. And if we follow God's word for our life, we will have the same opportunity in life. It's the opportunity to suffer persecution. 
Are we avoiding that? Is that something that we try to avoid? I would say yes. But I'm going to tell you, Jesus said it will come if you follow him. You will find persecution finding you. All you have to do is follow the Bible and persecution will find you. Just as the Spirit by the Apostle Paul told the church in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, that all who desire to live godly in Christ will suffer persecution. How many is that? All who desire to live godly in Christ will suffer some kind of persecution. Well, that's not a promise that we put in a nice frame and hang on the wall, is it? But it's a promise of God just the same and a promise we can rejoice in just as Jesus said. If God is using your life to bring people to the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're going to suffer persecution from all different areas. And as I said, the most hurtful ones come from people who say they believe in God. And they tell you to back off this Jesus thing. Stop talking about Jesus in public. You shouldn't do that. That's shameful. You, you should be ashamed of yourself for trying to lay your religious beliefs on people. You, you shouldn't do this. And there's going to be laws in the future that outlaw that because of the coming world that we see. They are blaming the deaths of millions pe of people on religion. It's already happening in China and Russia. It's against the law to openly share your faith with anybody. They can put you in jail for it. And it's because the government has said religion is the cause of all these people being killed. It's religion. And if you look at it from a secular point of view, you would probably agree with them. But one thing we realize is that Jesus is not another religion. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by him, according to Jesus. So Jesus isn't a religion. He's the way. And all of these religious things are being put together with all of the gun control and everything else we say being put in order so the Antichrist can control the world. And it's coming to a world near you. It's about time we realize it and understand what's taking place spiritually in this world. We won't have to go far to find persecution. If we live for Jesus, I guarantee you, it will find you. So the religious authorities at the Jewish temple lay hands on the apostles for preaching in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was the priests that served in the temple or the Levites, the captain of the temple guard or the temple police, and a section of the governing Jewish body called the Sadducees. And a clue to why they were greatly disturbed, it says, or deeply annoyed, comes from the Sadducees' doctrinal theological position about God, that there was no valid, active, supernatural work of God taking place in people's lives. In fact, they didn't believe in the bodily resurrection from the dead. They were very adamant about it. They would today be considered liberal theologians where the Pharisees, the other part of that group, would be considered the more conservative theologians, and both of them were wrong about Jesus. Is the world we live in today wrong about Jesus? Most of it is. Hopefully, if you believe God's Word is in the Bible, you're not going to be wrong about Jesus. But you have to study the Bible. You have to go to a place and be taught and discipled in the truths of God. It's what the Bible tells us. This is how we grow in Christ. We're taught by God, by, by people God puts in the church. Watch out for the ones that ask for money. Just a tip. <laughs> Watch out for the ones in funny hats. Just a tip. But people that are willing to teach you systematically the Word of God, it's because they have been taught the Word. 
And they know there's power and truth in the Word of God. And isn't that what we need today? Above all else. Is it a better retirement plan? The government keeps changing that all the time. <laughs> About the time you get it figured out, guess what? Inflation goes through the roof. We need the truth of God in our life for security. And that's what the Bible teaches us. This was the same Jewish council that brought Jesus before them the day that he was crucified. The Sadducees. The Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Sadducees were mainly comprised of the social elite. The incredibly wealthy and powerful. They controlled all of Jerusalem. And I think they controlled a lot of what the Romans did as well because they just paid them off. When we look at the issues of corruption in the world today, there's a, a dear couple in our church that are from Romania. They came to the United States in the 50s and he told me his story. And Paul and Lydia, Hank, you probably know them. And he told me how they had to escape from Romania back in communist-controlled um, Eastern Europe. And they did it by paying people off, high-ranking government officials, paying them off from, from Romania to Yugoslavia into, into um, Switzerland, into um, uh, Italy, and finally made it to America, dirt poor. And he said, it's just the way Eastern Europe works. It's full of corruption. They really can't handle democracy. But in America, democracy is much more sophisticated and it's just as corrupt. And I'm like, you're a very learned man. What you just said was very true. We live in a fallen world system that's absolutely corrupt. And if, if they can buy you, they will. Remember that. But Jesus is the answer and the truth to all of these enigmas that we face. It's a perception that sets us free from this corrupt world we live in. This is the same council that brought Jesus before them and condemned him to be crucified. They didn't like any outsiders. They wouldn't just let anybody go into that temple court area and begin to preach. You had to be verified by them. And so when Jesus showed up, they were immediately against him. And now Peter and John, and they're like, what? Who do these guys think they are coming into our temple and telling people about Jesus? Arrest them now. And as they arrested Peter and John, and presumably the, the man that was miraculously healed, because we see that man with him the next day in the trial, they put him in jail overnight. The jails would often be lower areas. They were kind of like dungeons, dark, and damp. Can you imagine the anxiety of Peter and John? The guy that was healed, he's just glad he can walk. But Peter and John, they're thinking, I, I'm, I, I would have loved to have heard that conversation. John's like, Peter, I told you to be careful about what you said. And, and thinking about, they have just come against the most powerful group in all Israel. Men that controlled every aspect of their society. What were they going to say? What were they going to do? Were they going to be condemned to death as well? And I would suppose, knowing how the Holy Spirit works, that the Spirit reminded Peter and John of the words of Jesus that when they call you before the councils and the synagogue, not if, but when, do not worry about what you will speak because in that very hour, the Holy Spirit will give you the word to speak to them. I bet they remembered that one. And I bet they also remembered the words of Jesus who said, Because I live, you too shall live. They had seen the power of the resurrection. So as they thought about, these guys are going to take us out back tomorrow and kill us. We see them do that to others in the book of Acts. And I'm sure Peter was like, Don't forget, Jesus is alive. If they kill our bodies, we're going to rise again with Jesus. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave is in us. Remember that. 
Jesus told us this would happen. It's okay. We're going to be all right. But what about the lame guy? I'm sure they were telling him about Jesus all night, right? It's so important for us to remember these things as well. To remember the word of God to us in any given place in our lives where we're threatened, we're challenged, we feel anxiety and despair and hopelessness in life. If you are a believer in Jesus, you've put your trust in him, you have the same access to the Holy Spirit that we see here in the book of Acts. The problem is, is we don't know it and we, we don't practice accessing these things because usually we can just buy our way out of something or, or do something else. This world offers us a lot of options instead of trusting in Jesus. And God allows us to go through difficult places, even persecution, so that we can, we can find the power of God and live authentic Christian lives. I mean, how many of you guys want to just play some kind of go-to-church-on-Sunday religious game? You don't. I know you don't. You want to know the real Jesus. You want to know the power of God that we see in the book of Acts, right? I know you do, because that's why you're in this place. As Peter and John are arrested there, they remember, no doubt, the word of God, and so must we. We need to start now telling ourselves what God has said in our minds when fears and doubts come in the present, because they will come in the future. It's just the way life is. It's a mess. It's messed up. God has allowed it to bring people to his son and to learn to put their trust in him. And in the, the midst of all this conflict, the, the Peter and John are jailed with the guy that was just miraculously healed. We read in verse 4 that many who heard the word Peter spoke believed or trusted for salvation in Jesus the Messiah. And the number was about 5,000 men. Man, is that incredible or what? And it's possible Peter and John don't even know this because they're rushed off and incarcerated. They don't even realize what God had done. And the same is true for us. As we tell people what God's word says, we don't know what God is doing behind the scenes. That God is working. God is on the move. God is still saving people today. And it gives us the motivation. We need to do what Peter did here. Speak the word of God and trust in the power of God. Speak it to yourself and speak it to those around you. But we're going to learn how to do that by the Holy Spirit. You know, I'm thinking that as they arrest Peter and John, and presumably the guy that was healed, the crowd just stand there going, what are you guys doing? <clears throat> this is obviously a miracle of God. Don't mess with us. Don't. And maybe they're just really fed up with all of this corruption, the corrupt rulers, the guys Jesus confronted, and it's all coming back. And as Peter preaches the truth of the gospel, the truth makes them free just like it will in all who put their trust in Jesus, even today. And this is the kind of freedom in Christ that should impact every segment of our lives, free from the corruption of this world and even our old nature, free now to walk with God in power and in truth. That's the kind of Christianity God wants us to have. And notice, it was through hearing the word. The word of truth in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what we are responsible to do as those that know the word. We live the word. We speak the word. We give the word of God to people around us because hopefully 
we know what the Bible says, right? A couple of weeks ago, one of the main themes of the teaching was, is this the Word of God? And if you're not convinced of it, you won't go any further. But if you're convinced in an Almighty God that would give His Word to His people throughout all generations, and you know you have the Word of God, it's going to permeate your life and change you forever. It's going to bring you into that kind of freedom that we see happening in Acts chapter 4. The Bible says there's power in the Word of God to change lives. The, the Apostle Paul said that the Word of God is never chained. Nobody can stop it. So you speak it and you believe it. If people want to argue with the Word of God in the Bible, we know their hearts are hard and only God can soften a hard human heart, and He will. And we pray. We pray, God, soften their hearts, and we continue to give them the Word. And we love them enough to continue to give them the Word and to pray for them as often as we can think about them. Because God wants them saved. God wants them free. God wants them full of power. That's what God wants, and that's what we pray. All right? You guys okay with that? That's where we need to be in all of it. So in verse 5, it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders and scribes, as well as Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many were of the family of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem, and when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? The council is gathered, like the Supreme Court. Only it's 70 men plus the high priest. And we find out there were some other family members of the high priest there as well. We see Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, who was the son-in-law of Annas that we learn from the Gospels, and family members of the high priest. Many scholars believe John and Alexander were probably sons of Annas. They were there to learn because they could possibly be the next high priest. We know from history Annas was deposed by the Roman government in A.D. 14, and his son-in-law Caiaphas was appointed by the Roman governor but the people still saw Annas as the true high priest. And let me tell you something, they were all corrupt. The only reason that Rome deposed Annas is he wouldn't pay them enough. They bring in Caiaphas, now he's willing to play the game. Have you ever heard people tell you that? You know, buddy, you just got to learn how to play the game. When we were trying to build part of an orphanage in, in uh, Ukraine, and working with a missions group, I'm like, what's taking them so long? We've been doing this for 24 months. And they're like, you don't understand. This is a corrupt place they live in. They can't just go down to the store and buy truckloads of material. Why not? We send them all this money. Because as soon as the, the government or the mafia sees they've got resources, they, they kidnap them. And they say, we want more money. Or they tell them, I'm sorry, but you need protection. <laughs> yeah, protection from you. So they have to go to, to a place and buy like a pallet of blocks at a time. They go and they buy one stack of lumber at a time so that they, they're under the late radar. Everybody thinks they're poor. Everybody's out for the American Christian dollar because they know the church just gives. So you realize that this whole place is corrupt, and God loves them. God wants them to come to the truth. He's even willing to work with their corruption, and he will send Jesus Christ to them just like he has with these guys. It was Annas, if you remember, who oversaw the money changers and the, the sellers of animals, sacrificial animals, in the temple courtyard that Jesus threw out. 
You remember in the Gospels, he went into that area and he turned over the tables of the money changers and drove out all the animals, the oxen and everything, with a whip. And, and he told them, you are, uh, you've turned my father's house into a den of thieves. That's who Annas is. Annas ran that. So it tells you just a little bit about Annas. So the council is gathered in the judgment hall at Jerusalem. The leaders are on this raised platform in a semicircle around the accused, looking down upon them with this pious authoritarian attitude. And they ask Peter and John an interesting question, by what power or authority or by what name have you done this? Speaking of healing the lame man. And because the healing of the lame man was indisputable, apparently the guy is standing right there, and they saw this lame guy. It, we're going to learn in the second part, he was over 40 years old. They all knew who he was. So that part of it was indisputable. That man was miraculously healed. So the council challenged the apostles on the authority and the name by which the miracle was done, which the law of Moses in Deuteronomy 13 requires them to do. If it's not in the name of Yahweh Elohim, Almighty God, then they're blasphemers. And that's why they asked John and Peter this. They already knew. John and Peter would invoke the name of Jesus and then the council would charge them with blasphemy and take them out back and kill them with rocks, stone them to death. Or that appears to at least been their plan, but they didn't count on what would happen next. Verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man by what means he has been made well, let it be made known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. At that point you could hear a pin drop. And then Peter adds to it and says in verse 11, this is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Peter, you're just making this worse, right? They were already looking for a reason to kill you, and now they've got one. Peter, it says, was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he speaks to the rulers. It's implying he's under the influence of the Holy Spirit as he speaks to these rulers. And then we remember the things Jesus used to say to these guys. He wasn't very nice to them. In fact, he gave them the greatest insult he said he could. He said, you are a bunch of whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. You are unclean. You're unclean to yourself and you're unclean to God. That's why they killed Jesus. Because he told them the truth about themselves. Was it true? It was true. Well, should he have said that? Wasn't that a little offensive? If you love somebody, you're going to tell them the truth, especially when they're trying to kill you. <laughs> and that's what Jesus does. It's everything that Jesus does is of the Father, and the Father is love. Everything Jesus does is because of that motivation of love. Jesus cared about these, these rulers, these men. He knew they were blind and wicked and corrupted and ignorant. 
He knew that they were blinded by their own success and the position in life that God had allowed them to have. And he came to set them free. But he had to tell them the truth about themselves. Because until we acknowledge to God the truth about ourselves, we're never going to be free. It's called confessing, agreeing with God about what's really happening inside me. And because God is love and God loves us enough to give us freedom through his son, we should have no problem in doing that with God and being sincere with God and even saying, God, whatever it takes, I want you to help me. That was my prayer in 1988. By the end of that year, I was in prison. God was helping me. He put me in protective custody to protect me from myself. <laughs> and he loved me enough to meet me in that stupid, stubborn place and help me. And he will for anyone that will just be truthful with themselves. Peter says, Peter, it says, was filled with the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit we see in Acts chapter 2 that they were baptized in. The same Holy Spirit we see in chapter 3 moving upon Peter with those gifts of word of knowledge and word of wisdom to raise this man to his feet. No human will do that without the Holy Spirit. And it's interesting, the word filled in verse 8 from the, the original ancient Greek language implies a continual or an ongoing filling of the Holy Spirit. And we know that because in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, the Apostle Paul used this same terminology and construction when he exhorted the people not to be drunk or filled with wine, which is wasteful, but to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. And from the Greek reading, be continually being filled. That's what we see happening to Peter. This is the way we study the Bible. We look at these things and see if they match up so that we get a context. We understand what the process is and we also realize it's for us. Same Holy Spirit. Same Jesus. Same Word of God. The power of God is available for us, beginning in our own lives, experiencing that transformation and freedom we have in Christ to live for God's kingdom when the world wants to enslave us. It's okay if you go to a church, but you serve the world. We say, no, we don't serve the world anymore. If you talk about Jesus at work, you'll lose your job. Well, okay, but people need to be saved. And I don't depend upon my job. I depend upon God. Those are real Christians. And we need to live like real Christians in this world today. In America, we don't get challenged that much. I did on the railroad. When I worked for them, they had a diversity council. I was reported that I talked to people about Jesus at work. But their policy said as long as someone asked me, then I could share. And God, the Spirit, brought that all to my mind. And I said, I've honored your policy. And I only talk to people who ask me because I'm a pastor. And why don't you get a hold of these accusers and we'll all meet together and have a really good time. I didn't say that. I just said, where are the accusers? Let's talk to them. Because I'm, I'm going to honor my employer. I'm going to do what you say. And people ask me about Jesus all the time. Not in a very nice way sometimes. But. <laughs> Be continually being filled. We see a perfect example with Peter here. Remember, Jesus said, don't worry about what you will say when they call you before the magistrates and the councils, because the Spirit will give you that word in that very hour. You guys remember 1 Corinthians 12? Word of knowledge, word of wisdom. Another perfect example of that taking place here. The same Holy Spirit that's available to you. So what Peter says is being led and influenced by the Holy Spirit, right? Wouldn't that be a great asset for us in our lives today? 
with our families, with our spouses, with challenges we face in this world, to have the Holy Spirit be able to show us what to do and how to speak, how to even speak to ourselves. Because frankly, we get in a lot of situations where we're really afraid. If I do that, then this is going to happen, and I'll lose it all. That's what we're always faced with. I'll lose it all. I'll lose it all. That's a lie. You will not lose it all. You will gain it all. The, the truth is that it's all in Christ. You will always gain it all. He has so much better for your life than what you're clinging to now. As we desire to live for Jesus in this life and to tell others about the truth of Jesus, we have to acknowledge the Holy Spirit. We have to, to be truthful with ourselves about those things in life. And I tell you, this is valid today to any person that wants to live their life for Jesus. And if you do, you're going to suffer persecution. Sometimes from family, sometimes from spouses, um, sometimes even the religious establishment. It's the same Holy Spirit. It's the same Holy Spirit a believer in Jesus has today. But we haven't tapped into the power of the Holy Spirit for the most part because we're afraid. We're really afraid of things and we have anxiety and that's okay. The best thing you can do is tell Jesus, I'm afraid. I'm afraid to let go. I'm afraid that I won't make enough money for my retirement. I'm afraid that if I, if I really get after this, that at work, I'm going to lose my job. I'm afraid. Would you help me and fill me with the Holy Spirit? You're going to find supernatural power in your life. You're going you're to find the, the freedom that Jesus promised to his disciples. And I want to tell you something I've learned about life. About 99% of what we're afraid of never happens. At least that's the way it's been with me. It never happens, but I'm afraid of it. And then I realize something else is trying to influence me. And it's demonic. It's coming from the pit. And it's trying to hold me in bondage so I can't be free. In this place, in this section, starting in verse 8, we notice a few things. We notice what the Holy Spirit looks like when he's upon somebody's life. I made a few notes here about this. Looking at what Peter says to these religious rulers, and number one, we see that Peter was respectful. Peter was respectful. He acknowledged them as, as the rulers. He didn't call them whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. <laughs> he was respectful to them. He addresses them with respect. He's not all up in his emotions from what we can tell by the text. And then also we notice that we will be truthful that our own personal agenda or bias, which Peter could have easily fallen to, you killed my Lord and Savior. And if I had a sword, I'd chop off your ear. <laughs> we see him being truthful and controlled. Whenever we're standing in the truth, it brings about this place of, of peace and calmness. We don't get all out there and start hacking off people's ears with swords. And then we see that it will point to Jesus. He points all this to Jesus immediately in a pretty short sermon. And it will always point to the truth of the resurrection. Do you know how important that is to us? Because deep inside, we feel like we're going to die sometimes. Because we're just so full of despair and hopelessness. We think that this is never going to get any better and we feel like we're going to die. And that's when we must remind ourselves, because he lives, I too shall live. That's what enabled 
Peter to be in jail all night, probably calm John down and the other guy and say, it's going to be okay. Remember, we saw Jesus alive, right? So who's got power over death? And John's like, Jesus does. So stop crying. Let's go in there and be real men. <laughs> So it's pointing to the resurrection and it will point to known facts or accepted truth. This was this healed man. We really like what Pete Greer does here working with creation science. It points to known facts and accepted truth. You can't argue with that. You could try to argue with it, but then you know it's a lie. You know, people that study those things, they know the truth. Peter points to this healed, healed man. There's the proof. You can't deny it. It'll point to fulfilled prophecy as well. Valid, fulfilled prophecy validates the supernatural, sovereign, eternal work of God in this world. God spoke it a thousand years ago, and you just saw it happen. That's validating the power of God, and that's exactly what Peter did. He mentions Psalm 118. I don't think it was Peter. I think it was the Holy Spirit. It's like, you tell them. It's like he's moving on. Peter is just coming out. It's like, you are the builders that rejected the chief cornerstone. Jesus had already told them this once. It's, psalm 18 was recognized as a messianic psalm. So they knew exactly what Peter was saying. So these kinds of evidences will confirm the work of the Holy Spirit in and through our lives and always be in a place that's pointing to the eternal risen Savior Jesus. And this is why Jesus came. It wasn't just to give us a better life, even though following Jesus does give us a better life. But sometimes, many people can suffer great persecution when they follow Jesus. And it's not a better life. And Jesus didn't come just to give us peace, because following Jesus, following Jesus in a biblical way can cause such turmoil in your life. My own family told me they wanted nothing to do with me because I was following Jesus. They told me you were better off on drugs. And I'm like, how can you say that? I haven't been in jail in over a year. <laughs> Come on! So it could cause great turmoil in our lives. And certainly nowadays, I think being an authentic Christian, an acts Christian, a real follower of Jesus is not going to make us accepted in our social society, even by many of the religious establishments. I see some of these guys on TV that have reverend in front of their name. They're not Christians. They say they are, and they're not. Jesus pointed this out in the book of Revelation. He pointed this out in the Gospels. It's not what they say, it's what they do. That's how you know who they are. That's good down-to-earth farm boy logic. I like that. It's not what they say, it's what they do. That's how you know who they are. And in this place, Peter who evidently is fairly gifted to keep a calm head in all this, tells him, if we're being judged for doing good to this helpless man, then so be it. But I want you to know one thing. It is in the name, the power, and the authority of Jesus of Nazareth. And he said this to make it clear to them, the name of Jesus Christ. Christ is not the last name of Jesus. It's his title. It really means Messiah. Jesus Messiah of Nazareth. He used the word Nazareth because the religious rulers, that's how they identified Jesus because many people were named Yeshua, which is the Hebrew, or we might say Joshua. The, the derivative would be Jesus. But uh, he made sure they knew exactly who he was talking about. And he, in that place, identified Jesus as the Messiah, whom you killed, but God raised up. 
That's what proves he is the Messiah. And what you see today validates the ministry of Jesus. This, this Jesus that did all of these miracles that you saw now is doing them and you can't stop him. It's that Jesus. He made that message very clear to these men. And I, I think today, you know, the evidence of a changed life, they, Peter pointed to this man's changed life. And I think the evidence of a changed life is so powerful because we really can't change ourselves. We can do things that we try hard and these different things, but we can't change who we are. But God can. Through being born again by believing in the work of the gospel of Jesus Christ and then being discipled to learn how to live to this new nature and not controlled by that old corrupt nature anymore. Being free from fear and from doubt. The freedom that comes from Jesus you can't find anywhere else. Many of you have experienced that in your life. The proof of changed lives is all around us, but I want you to know there's something more important than a changed life. Jesus came to give us eternal life because all humanity is dying here, right? If Jesus waits much longer, many of us will physically pass away, yet we will live. We will be resurrected, just like Jesus was. Can't keep a good man down, right? So in that place, we realize this is why Jesus came, and that's why Peter adds verse 12. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Saved from the death that you're facing in your very life. You could be here today and you feel dead. You don't feel life. And it's gnawing away at your soul. There's a lot of reasons for those things. But Jesus is always the ultimate answer. Giving our lives to Jesus brings life. That as Peter spoke to this, this religious group of guys, they were... I couldn't say all of them. I don't think all of them were corrupt because we know Nicodemus was there. We know that Joseph of Arimathea was part of that group. But most of them were corrupt and they held the power. Think about the conviction they felt as this fisherman stands there in the power of the Holy Spirit and makes them face the truth about themselves. That was the Messiah. You killed him because of your corrupt nature. Man, the power that was taking place there, and God always wins in those places. No doubt they felt the conviction of that selfish, self-serving life as they live these opulent lives, and 99.5% of the rest of the people lived in dirt poverty. And then they told the people to believe in God. you got to know they felt conviction in their lives every single day. But they hardened their hearts against God. Their hearts became calloused against God. And here God reaches them once more through the truth. No doubt the conviction was there. And maybe it's even with us today. You might think, well, we're not rich rulers like those guys. It, relatively, in America, if you have a roof over your head, fairly decent clothes and a cell phone, you're richer than 95% of the whole world. Did you know that? That's what the statistics show us. We have food in our stomach day by day. I mean, we are one of the, the, the top percentages of all civilization. And you may feel guilty over that at times. I know my wife and I do. And we, we asked the Lord, God, are we not giving enough? Was, and I've always felt the Lord was like, you know, what are you feeling right now? I go, I feel guilt. He goes, well, then you know that's not for me, right? I move you with love. I don't drive you with guilt. Be aware of these things. What's driving you in life? That, that I love these people that God loves. Show us a new way. 
show us a creative way to reach them. Our church has been doing special missions outreaches overseas for the last three months. And it's neat how the Lord is showing us this one group comes up and says, hey, do you guys want to buy 500 Bibles to go to the Middle East? And I'm like, I'm emailing our church board, hey, you guys want to buy 500 Bibles? They're like, yeah. So we send them over there through open doors or, or Voice of the Martyrs or Samaritan's Purse, these groups that are in there doing this stuff. So I'm excited about that for this church, doing those things, because we know God loves these people. And even buying food for Muslim people. We sent a huge offering at the first of the year to buy food for Muslim people, given to them by Christians. And these Muslims have had it with Islam. They've had it. It's a mess. They're killing each other. They're killing everybody, killing everybody all up in here. You know what I'm saying? So these people are saying that it has to be false because there's no love. And the Christian comes and says, we want to give you food because God loves you. That's how it works, right? So notice he says, there is no other name under heaven or in all the earth by which man must be saved. As Jesus himself verified this in John chapter 14, verse 6, right? You guys remember that one. Jesus declared that he was the singular, exclusive way to God, right? Any other way? Not according to Jesus. Jesus verified that he was the singular, exclusive truth about God. You want to know about God? You go to Jesus through the Bible. It's all about Jesus from cover to cover. Behold, in the volume of the book, written of him. And then he verified that he was the singular light in this world. There's no light apart from Jesus. He is the light in this world. There's so many people that are offended that we would say Jesus is the only way. And I often tell them in a polite way, I didn't say that. Jesus did. And he died and rose again, so it verified what he said was the truth. And now he's alive in me, so I'm sharing that with you. And by the way, do you have a better way? Do you have another way to God? Well, I believe if we just try hard enough, and, and if we're good people, and I'm like, you got two check-offs there. You know, the Bible says we're all sinful. So who are you kidding here? Let's talk about the truth for a minute about you and God. You can do that with people and you can do it in a nice way. If they don't want to hear it, they'll turn around and walk away, which many do. Peter, by the Holy Spirit, then told them of the stone which the builders rejected. The council knew it was a prophecy of Psalm 118 that pointed to the Messiah being rejected by the rulers. They interpreted that to mean that the Gentiles would reject the Messiah. But it was they that were rejecting the Messiah. They thought this prophecy was about someone else or some other place in time, but it pertained directly to them, and Peter said it to their face. You have rejected the chief cornerstone. You are the builders who have rejected the Messiah. Because I just told you, you killed him, but God raised him from the dead. Who wins on that one? God raised him from the dead. Jesus, this cornerstone upon which all is built in, in all of eternity, and us as well as eternal beings in God's you know, this, this incomplete existence. And if our lives are not built upon that truth, that rock of Jesus in the Gospels, when the storms of life come, Jesus said, that foundation, that man-made foundation, your very best you could do in life will be washed away. And the only way to be secure in life is to build our lives upon that rock, that cornerstone. This is where our human logic at times interferes with this process. But, but, but how? How? When? Where? We are called to believe God's word by faith, not by logic. 
And we must find ourselves in a place of faith that says, I'm going to build my life on the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And also the, the evidence of the Holy Spirit that's within me and the word of God, that's it. I don't know how. I don't know where it will work, but I know it's what Jesus said. That's faith. That's where we have to find ourselves in this ever-changing world. And it's going to change at a rapid pace starting this year. How do you know? Unfortunately, I watch TV. <laughs> I see what's going on in the world. I see what's happening in the Middle East. And it's going to start changing rapidly. Today, it's against the law to talk to anybody about any religious matters outside of your designated registered place, whether it's Islam, Christianity, whatever it may be. It's the same way in China. The world powers are now outlawing any religious activity, and it's coming to a United States near you. Things are going to change really fast. It's because of the religious ideologies that so many people are being killed, right? We mentioned earlier. So you, we see the writing on the wall like Daniel, and we know what it says because we have the word of God and the spirit. In this place, Peter answers their question, by what power or by what name have you done this? You need to have that answer in your life. Hopefully, Jesus has answered that question for us. And he's become our chief cornerstone, that solid rock upon which we build our lives. And if not, today is the day that you recognize that. And you realize that all of this has been interfacing through my life, but I'm like the religious council. I thought it was about somebody else. But it's been about me all along. I have that same fallen nature. I have those same propensities. I have all of those weaknesses that they have. And yet, I have the truth of God and the Holy Spirit. You could be seeing things in your life now and all Jesus wants you to do is agree with him about it. It's called confessing. And confession leads to repentance, changing your mind about it. I'm no longer going to be, be, be controlled by lies in my life, that I'm hopeless, I have despair, that, that there's, there's nothing good going to happen because I've been born again, I'm a child of God, and I'm going to heaven, to God's kingdom. The sooner the better, amen? That's the truth for your life. And that kind of truth will put you in this world filled with the Holy Spirit. Take advantage of it now. Because in heaven, man, everybody's going to know Jesus. They'll be able to look at him. I'm going to sign up to give tour guides to the temple. So we, we have this great opportunity now, but we have to do it through the power of God, right? Can't do it through the power of religion. Can't do it through our own understanding. We have to have the Holy Spirit. Maybe that's you today and you can tell the Lord, I'm at the end of my rope. I want to ask the music ministers to come as we close. I guess I went, I'm long-winded. I went over. Like Mike, he prophesied. <laughs> that announcement guy. Let's all stand together. Today you could be faced with these things and Jesus is your hope. The Holy Spirit has great power to work in your life greater than anything man-made. And all we have to do is Say, Jesus, I haven't been putting my trust in you. I've been believing everything but you. And I need that power in my life to lift me up. And that we would get into the Word of God daily because that lifts us up as well. To believe in the power of God. Let's close with that thought this morning. To go forth and believe in the power of God for our lives to live extraordinary lives filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. We have had enough of getting everything we want. And we are weary of 
living this life just for us. Don't forgive us all, seeking your hand and not your faith. So come and empty us from the deaths within this place. Holy Spirit, fill us with your fire. Give us your desire and hold us close to you. Holy Spirit, give us revelation, healing, visitation, nothing else will do. Your desire Hold us close to you Holy Spirit Give us revelation Healing visitation Nothing else will do Cause we want more and more And more and more of you we want more and more and more and more of you. If you're here today and you've never asked Jesus into your life, you've never prayed and, and confessed that you're sinful and you need a Savior, you can do that right now. Even in the privacy of your own mind. Jesus, save me. If you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit in your life, you just tell God, I need that. I need it. And I need a continual feeling as I come before you in the Word each day. If you're battling with things in life, we want to pray for you today because we know the power of God in this place. We know what it can do in people's lives. And we want God to work in your life. Amen? Amen. Give God praise this morning. We thank you, Jesus. Amen.